it's the next level. Hey, my name is Ross Marquand and I play Red Skull. You are listening to Panels to Pixels podcast. Check it out. What are you supposed to be, a clown or something? Sometimes. It's more like surfing than skating. I wish the rain was out just once. It can't rain all the time. Eric? Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. I'm Mark. And I'm Laura. And today we talk about the 1994 movie, The Crow, starring Brandon Lee. Now, this movie became infamous because Brandon Lee died during filming. Lee was killed when a prop gun was fired at him, you know, uh, during a specific scene. The film was almost completed at the time of his death, but they completed the film rewriting parts of the script... CGI implemented in the film and use of stunt doubles to complete certain shots. Now, this movie has had a legacy over the years as being a cult classic movie for comic book genre films. And this came out at a time when pretty much comic books weren't like the big thing in film. So, since it's at its 25th anniversary, we figured we would do this. Honestly, we should have put this out months ago because it was, came out in May. But uh, uh, through delays of podcasting, Lara was eager to help us out today. And uh, we had to drop the idea of a roundtable. We were expecting to have a lot of people. But other podcasters have other things. So, we'll have this out at least in time just after... Halloween, so everybody could enjoy it for November. It's good timing, you know? It's almost Devil's oh, Day. Yeah. <laughs> that would be Wednesday. <laughs> Devil's Day. Yes, night. day before Halloween. Basically, uh, we'll start off with the first question, which would be, what's your background or relationship with the 1994 movie The Crow? Lara, what did you, what do you have? I know you're a comic book fan, but... Yeah, I'm a comic book fan, and I actually picked up the original comic sometime in probably the early 90s because I think I was in my senior year in high school so it must have been around 1990 or so and um, I was a big comic book fan then I was a big fan of kind of underground indie comics like you know the Sandman and lots of the Vertigo comics and Dark Horse comics that were out at that yep. time and came across this one from recommended for from some of my friends who worked at the comic book store that I, I frequented and found it really interesting and bought all, I think there are maybe only four, four, four to six issues. I'm not sure, but um, yeah. Yeah. I read through all of them and then was really excited when I'd heard that the movie was coming out. I knew that they were making a movie about it. My husband, who actually um, decided to go see Dragon, the Bruce Lee story. Do you remember that movie? Oh yeah. Had a, uh, Oh, for, I forget the name of the actor in it, but I think his last name was also Lee. Jason Scott Lee. So we were actually, yeah, yeah. So we were actually, that, and I believe that movie came out the year before The Crow did. Yep. We were getting ready to leave Field on the set while filming this movie. So as we were watching the uh, Dragon, the Bruce Lee story, it was very ominous and strange because there is a scene there with Brandon and he's, um, kind of being chased by this ominous force that always seemed to follow Bruce Lee and he's kind of looking at him and the little boy playing Brandon runs away and that's like all I could think about during the movie was that as we're watching this movie about the strange uh supposed so basically you you went to the movie and you you were seeing this dragon movie you saw the the dragon the Bruce Lee story and you know, all you could think about when you saw The Crow is all you could think about is young Brandon Lee when you saw The Crow, probably. Yeah, I mean, it was a year later after we saw that because obviously he died on set and then it took time to go back and produce the movie considering it hadn't been completed yet. So it was a year later, but it was it was right before we left to go see Dragon, the Bruce Lee story that we found out about him passing away on set. Yeah, and it was just very strange and ominous. It always stay, stuck with me. That, actually, that was a uh, within those few years. It was all Bruce Lee based a lot with uh, with the Dragon movie, and I think it was an anniversary of Bruce Lee at that point too. But Brandon was coming 
into his zone as far as an actor doing rapid fire and then he did another movie with uh, Dolph Lundgren and Mm -hmm. then he scored this where he was the leading character and he did very well with it everybody thought of him as a leading man this was the first time he was put in a leading man perspective in a movie and they thought with the name Lee and him being the son of Bruce Lee that it would market well and then unfortunately the movie was delayed for almost a year because originally it was filmed in 93 Mm -hmm. and it took them all that time to figure out how to complete the movie so that way it could be presented to an audience and they had to use a lot of different things that we'll get into a little later yeah my uh my (laughs) I was first introduced to the movie based upon the idea of the controversy, but I knew when it was coming out, I knew it was Brandon Lay, and I knew the name, and I had seen him in Rapid Fire, so I wanted to see it. Plus, when they started saying it was based after a comic book, made me wanted to go see it. Now, mind you, by that time, I was out of comic books. Uh, I wasn't collecting or anything. I hadn't done so in like three years or so. So I decided, you know, a friend wanted to go. She had to go. So I went, and then after I saw the movie, I really enjoyed it. You know, the movie was very good from when it came out. Very dark, very brooding, very gothic. Mm -hmm. And at that time, grunge music was the big thing. And on top of that, the music soundtrack was very good because you had a variety of different music. And I love music, and I was in a band at that time. So basically, you had like Nine Inch Nails, Pantera, all this... And the soundtrack actually was pretty much almost like the movie in itself. You could just listen to the soundtrack and just picture images on, on certain things of from the film. So that grasped my attention, too, because I was in trade school at the time, mm-hmm. and uh, that was going around. And I listened to that soundtrack even before I saw the movie. So I, I was really intrigued by it, and I, I was happy. And I went, uh, actually, eventually, I wound up buying the trade paperback and reading it and loving the actual story itself, but was a little bit upset for the fact that we didn't get a lot of what was in the comic in the movie. Mm -hmm. And we'll get into that, too, later. Yeah, today, to this day, I still think that's one of the greatest movie soundtracks. Oh, yeah, definitely. It's something that I keep on my phone, too. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't know what it is like i've had my my niece actually heard it and she goes this is good stuff uncle mark what is it i told her and she she started listening to some of it my brother was like no we can't she can't listen to pantera no 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 she can't listen to henry rollins no 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 no." i was like but it's a it's a cover song it's okay (laughs) but uh you know she got into it now she's a little older obviously so now she she has the album (laughs) great the girls got good yeah she, ha- she likes her music. So so after your most recent watch, what was your impression of the movie now? Did it change compared to your first watching? You know, I really loved it when I first saw it. I think just because I was so familiar with the comic books and I don't know, just the whole Brandon Lee story with him dying on set. And it, it had this melancholiness around it that was... Uh, Actually, maybe kind of love the movie more. I, you know, I was a goth girl in in high school, and all of this stuff just completely resonated with me. Sort of the the dark melancholy of the crow and the soundtrack. I mean, Joy Division, Nine Inch Nails, oh, The yeah. Cure. So, I mean, not Joy Division. Well, there is a Joy Division song on there, but you know, that whole soundtrack. Yeah. Um, that felt to me like the zeitgeist of the entire like early. 90s you know that that explosion of alternative music grunge and industrial and goth all that was kind of their uh, golden era right there was the early 90s and I was all about oh, that. definitely so I loved the movie I think I rewatched it maybe a month or so ago yeah and um yeah still held up for me I still thought it was great I thought Brandon Lee's performance is just wonderful I think I think I think I like it now better than I did when I first watched it because at first I was just kind of (laughs) absorbing the story and didn't really take the uh, performance into account. But yeah, when I watched it, I was like, wow, he was really good in this. Yeah, he was. It's a shame that, you know, he passed away to to think exactly what he could have done with his career Mm -hmm. after that. And I don't see him just as 
like an action movie actor. I I, I saw him more of a comedic actor, mm-hmm. and that actually came from like Rapid Fire because some of the scenes in Rapid Fire he was a little bit comedic. There there was a couple in The Crow itself, mm-hmm. like when he looks at the <laughs> detective and he goes, "You're still wearing your hat." And he's still in his underwear. Yes. <laughs> or when uh, he's smoking like the cigarette that. and he's like, these things will kill you and takes a drag. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I honestly, I still love the movie. I think it holds well after 25 years. I usually watch this movie at least once a year because, and you'll laugh on Devil's Night. <laughs> yeah, perfect. But uh, uh, I just enjoy it for the fact that it was very well done. When I heard there was rumors that, you know, Jason Momoa would, take the role possibly it was like a year ago or just after aquaman came Mm -hmm. out i was not too certain that would be played well you know he was a bit fit but he wasn't you know i I love jason momoa but he's too gargantuan (laughs) for the character and i my opinion he'd literally break on his guitar his own guitar while he's playing it so (laughs) but but I, I still think of the movie as being a classic, and I still love the comic book itself, you know. And I still have the trade paper back that I bought back in 1994 after I saw the movie, too. So, th- things I hold on to. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, I'll admit that this was probably the only role I ever saw uh, Brandon Lee in, but that end scene where he's seeing Shelley and she's coming to him in the graveyard... And just how he's, oh, gosh, I was so taken by that scene. He plays it so well, just his pain and suffering. And then he sees her and it all melts away. And I just thought that was beautiful and agree with you that he could have done so much with his career. Yeah, dramatic, comedic, mm-hmm. uh, not just action, honestly. Romantic. I think of him. Movies, yeah, romantic, I know. <laughs> definitely. He was a pretty boy, trust oh, me. Oh, he I was know. very handsome. Oh, yeah. So, And he was taller than his father, from my understanding, too. Oh, so. yep. But, but that darn Lee legacy. Yeah. Well, not really. Uh, we'll get into that later. I actually did some research into that, but okay. I think it just, it's like a curse in itself, but that's just me. Mm-hmm. So what do you know about any uh, of the other Crow properties, like, you know, comic books, mm-hmm. TV series, other movies, or... What you know? Mm-hmm. What do you want to add to that? Do you, did you follow that after the movie? I watched the one sequel afterwards with Vincent Perez. Okay. Called I think it was City of Angels. Yes. And it was okay. It was uh, following the story of Sarah, the little girl who was in the Crow. Yep. And she's an adult in this one, and and the Crow. I mean, the whole mythos of the Crow now is that it is the spirit of vengeance, and it comes back to anyone Correct. who has died. Um, you know, under some sort of violent uh, way, and it's their way of coming back and taking vengeance. So the crow can be anyone that the spirit inhabits. Um, So I watched that one. It was pretty good, but after that, I just didn't really follow any of the other ones or the TV series or the comic books or anything like that. I felt the the comic book and the movie companion, the original one, were perfect and i didn't think i needed any more after that yeah i agree but to let all our listeners know there were other comic book spinoffs in the 90s after the first run that jay obar but jay obar was not really part of those runs he pretty much banked on the idea where he licensed it out to other artists and writers he basically oversaw what was going on he just did the original and left it that way and he thought that was all that needed to be in his opinion you know i mm-hmm. i really appreciate that and i like that idea myself and that's how i keep it myself i like the original i like the book but unfortunately i decided to go on that rabbit hole and look at all that stuff and over the years i actually watched the sequels other than just city of angels i saw the other two sequels that they put out and they were just I didn't like them. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> there was actually a TV show that came out after the movies, uh, in between yeah. the sequels, and it starred Mark Dacascos called The Crow Stairway to Heaven. Now, it was another view of the Eric Draven legacy. It's as if the movie never happened the way they treat it. 
but it only lasted from 1998 to 99 due to... Uh, you know, lack of viewership and everything else. I have the actual box set of the uh, the series because I like the idea of Eric Draven and I wanted to see where it went, and it was discounted years ago. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I give Mark DeCasco some credit. He did very well. It was kind of like those UPN 9 uh, <laughs> TV shows that they, back, they did back in the day where they were low-budget, and they tried their best. Now, the story had heart, but the action sequences and the effects weren't that great. The stunts were good, and the acting was okay. And Mark DeCascos did all right, in my opinion. But if you guys are interested and you love the idea of Eric Draven, that would be another way to go. Like I said, the, the sequels, I, went, I wasn't a fan. <laughs> <laughs> I was not into the idea of a new Crow movie, especially since the last one, the last sequel that came out had Eddie Furlong from Terminator 2 uh. fame in it, as well as a Crow-style character. And uh, I forget the blonde girl from American Pie. She was in it as well. And it was just terrible. Tara Reid? Yes. She, yeah, she was in it as well. Okay, that's one I probably won't be touching. Don't touch it. <laughs> it's scary. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like to keep the purity of what I enjoy without watering it down with a bunch of other stuff. So I'm probably <laughs> good with just the movie and the comics. Same here. I, I just stick with that. I actually lent the movie on dvd to my niece and she goes it's dark <laughs> and i'm like uh, i like the music <laughs> but it's dark okay all right and my brother dark was is in the lighting or dark is in the content the content and the story oh and well that... she better not read the comic books then <laughs> oh yeah well considering we'll get into this in a little bit <laughs> so we're gonna go into a little bit more interesting facts about the original movie as well as the comic so what do you have to add um there's a few differences between the movie and the comics. Like in the movie, Eric and Shelley are killed in their home rather than out on an abandoned road uh, like they were in the comic books. Yep. The movie is far less brutal than the comic books, in my opinion, especially the killing of El Eric and Shelley, which is just brutal. too brutal to go into. But yeah. if you read the comic, you you know what I mean. Yeah, exactly. um, but there's a couple of new characters in the movie, like uh, Sarah... The little girl, Sarah. Darla. Oh, yeah. Tintin was in the books, I think. I think I so, think too. He was. Yeah. yeah. But uh, the weirdest addition to the movie was Mika or Micah. I can't remember how her name is pronounced. I just looked up her name in IMDb. But the weird uh, sister. sister. Yeah. <laughs> of... Now, I thought his name was T-Bird because in the comic books, his name is T-Bird. But uh, apparently in the movie, his name's Top Dollar. Yeah, they changed that so that they'd have a larger, uh, like, mob-style character. And then mm -hmm. T-Bird was the second-in-command in the movie. Ah, okay. And then you had Tintin. What was it? Fun Boy? Fun Boy. And then I forgot the uh, skank. I think there was a Tom Tom. Was there a Tom Tom or am I just thinking of the comic? I think you're I tried to review comics. both really quickly. Yeah. yeah. I haven't. Honestly, I have not read the comic in a long, long time. I really need to go over that again. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, from my memory itself, I I'd gone over a few things. They had great scenes in the film that were very similar to the comic book. Just they changed and altered it. They did have references yeah. to the comic that they didn't add to the film as well. And for to give you an example, when Eric cuts himself, he cannot heal. And there's this kind of crazed moment in the comic where he goes crazy. You actually see mm -hmm. it. And he cuts himself, but he doesn't heal from those wounds. And he winds up using tape or gaffer tape or electrical tape to cover his wounds. We do mm -hmm. see those tape marks, and if you guys are listening, if you watch the movie, you'll actually see on Brandon Lee's hands, you'll see taped up going around his his hands up into his arm when he's got like uh, his sleeves up to his elbow. And that was something that they edited out in the movie. They thought it would have been a little bit too graphic of a scene to put in the film. And they were afraid for the MPAA uh, rating. It would have been, like, rated R. But they did film those scenes, but they scrapped them, apparently. So, yeah, that was one thing that I, I had to look into. Yeah, I think they added in uh, Sarah, Darla, and Mika, Micah, whatever her name was, to uh, add a few more female characters in. Because in the comic books, 
there's no. well they do have a Darla and they do have um a Sarah like character named Sherry who's a little girl that the crow has a discussion with um he doesn't have a history with her but he does talk to her on a on a uh, doorstep but um yeah i think just bulked up those couple of female characters and then um top dollar's weird witchy sister <laughs> yeah yeah, they needed something a little bit freaky, I think, in this with the witchy sister so that she comes into play and gives Top Dollar something. Mm -hmm. Sarah was added in, I think, to build the connection between, um, you know, Eric and his girlfriend who had passed. Mm -hmm. So that way there is a connection and it shows the love between both Eric and his girlfriend. And... On top of that, the idea of the mother of Sarah, they, they brought that in. Darla was brought in. Yeah, it was kind of like alluded in the comic, but I think they brought in Darla in the movie for the fact that, well, she has to have a background. Where did she come from? She can't be just some kid on the street. So that way yeah. they included her into the idea of these this gang and she was incorporated in some way via the bar. And that yeah, makes that sense. Yeah, that scene of... Uh... Darla with Fun Boy, yeah. where they're getting high, and then um, Eric, comes Eric in. follows her into the bathroom and, you know, says, oh, gosh, I wish I had written down the words, but something like, Mother is you know, the words on the hearts of all children, hearts and lips it's, of I all I think it's children. the name of God or the word of God on the hearts and lips of all children. I think you're correct. Looking for it. But yeah. yeah, that exact line comes from the comic books. I th and I think they just expanded her character more so that she's, she's, a, she works in the bar and yeah. all this stuff. But, and made it yeah. more impactful. Mm -hmm. Now uh, you could correct me if I'm wrong. There, there was like some sort of person that approaches Eric once he comes out of the grave and he's like a, uh, some sort of skull like uh, focal person. Or I could be wrong. I don't remember. Somebody. It might be Shelley. He has lots of flashbacks of Shelley, and there's one great um, graphic one in the comic books where he's dancing with her in her wedding gown, right. and sh she has the face of a skull. All right. Well, in the in the movie itself, they employed uh, a – well, there's a deleted scene. You can see it on YouTube. And they call it the skull cowboy scene, and that's oh, a deleted wow. scene that was originally intended for the film. It was filmed, but the – they took it they took it out because it took away from the story like basically the skull cowboy in the movie was to explain to eric what he is there to do and this happens all the time and basically telling him his story is that he has to take vengeance on those that took away from him from this brutal murder that happened to him a year previous so that way he could, they could write both him and Shelley's souls. But, uh, yeah, they, they kind of just edited that out because they felt that it kind of took away from the actual story itself of love and everything else. They just wanted to just, like, he's just basically driven just to, you know, take care of, like, what happened to him and Shelley and so he could get back to Shelley and go to heaven. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so in the comic book, it's kind of it's the rave, uh, the crow. I mean, the crow that speaks to him. That yeah, yeah, I think yeah, like things. a vessel or something. So mm -hmm. they might have did that purposely so that there's an actual figurehead or something. I took that yeah. as something out of when I saw this and I first heard about this. I looked it up and went into it. I thought it was something out of like Ghost Rider, and it's like, oh wow, he's the original crow or something. And but no, it wasn't. Well, that's that. cool though. I'm gonna have to look that up on YouTube. Yeah, you you should because it's there. If you if you type in um, deleted scene in the crow, they'll mm -hmm. they'll show all the deleted scenes, and that's one of them. They left it in a, in a bit, but the audio you get is basically film audio, and it's kind of grainy. So if you watch it on your big screen TV, it's gonna look kind of grainy in itself. On a smaller screen, it's a little bit better. Cool. So, but. Uh, now we could go into how uh, what had happened on set. So Brandon's death was it's still controversial within film to this day. But apparently the gun expert on the film 
had left early that day due to, according to some, were budget cuts, but apparently there was a lot of drug usage on the set. And Brandon had made comments a lot on set when, uh, when I watched this YouTube about it. The uh, interviewer stated, he goes, uh, they would, he would just talk about how half the budget went up people's noses and he wasn't even part of it. Uh, there was a lot of questioning on it, but apparently the prop master was the only one on set that day when this happened. So the gun was never cleaned properly. So what had happened was, I guess what they do is they put a dummy bullet in there, has an explosive, but you'd have to clean it every time. But apparently somebody did not clean it or they have not been cleaning the guns. And there was a piece of metal that was in the chamber. The gun was given to actor Michael Massey, also known as Fun Boy, for the rape or slash killing scene that was done in The Loft. And I guess that's why it's all over the place when they filmed it. So apparently he mm -hmm. had a bag over the gun and he shot it. And uh, the forensics uh, officer that went into it, and you could see this on YouTube as well if you guys want to see but uh, basically, there it was all shrapnel, and they kind of redid the scenario in a safe environment. And they said that was worse than a regular bullet in itself because there was so many pieces in it, and it would have scattered all over the place. So uh, it just, of all things, happened to Brandon at that point. And he he they all thought he was still acting when it happened. And when he asked, "I need a doctor. I need an ambulance." And it rushed him, but there was so much they couldn't even find the shrapnel that was in him until they actually did the autopsy. And they, it took them a couple of days, apparently. So it, it's a sad yeah. event that had happened, but that was the one thing that had happened. And uh, it goes down in the legacy of films, film accidents that are out there. Like there's one with the Twilight Zone, uh, like with Vic Morrow during the train mm -hmm. scene in Twilight Zone. And, yeah, I remember hearing about that. And there's a few others out there too. So a lot of people knock that up, but uh, as being like uh, another one of film's tragedies. And on top now, is of this, oh, I was just wondering, is that is this one of the few tragedies where the lead was killed yes. in a on-scene accident? Correct. And I always say it as this is like, the the lee family legacy of bad luck because you know it was bruce first then it brandon and i think he brandon has an actual sister too as well mm -hmm. and then linda lee had passed years previous you know about i would say a good like six years ago she passed away but wow. yeah but uh apparently it, it everybody calls it the lee legacy for because both of them died you know Bruce Lee died before Enter the Dragon was actually completed. You know, mm -hmm. it had to play after he passed away. Same thing with Brandon. So they all, they, there's all these conspiracy theories about what had happened. And, you know, like, you know, like the Yakuza or whoever were actually are after them or something. But I don't believe into that. I think it was just one of those things and it just happened. Yeah. Do you have any other things that you could talk about? For the comic um let me see here what i've got written down not so much the comic but i've got a couple of well maybe a little bit about the comic but some factoids about the comic and the movie sure unless you have these already but um i just recently found out that james obar uh wrote the comic in a response as a way to cope with the death of his girlfriend at the time who had been killed by a drunk driver yes that i knew yeah. and it's yeah. sad i think that's why he never really went back to do any more of this because it's a bad reminder <laughs> he once he wrote yeah. it he drew it that was it mm -hmm. yeah so out of tragedy came creativity i guess yeah yeah and then uh the ending credits are dedicated to brendan and eliza brandon and eliza his, eliza was his fiance, which makes the tragedy all the more that all the more sad because Eliza was his fiance and they were planning to get married. Was it after the movie wrapped? Yes. No. 
so, so tragic. Uh, and then finally, I'm sure you know this, Mark, as a music aficionado, but the soundtrack was produced by a young Trent Reznor. Yes, it was. And like you said before, he did a Joy Division cover and mm-hmm. actually sparked my interest in Joy Division because that was yeah. part of my education uh, in school. And I actually brought that up to one of my teachers while I was in trade school. And a lot of my teachers, oh, they were producers, engineers in uh, the professional medium. And my teacher, Rich Tremini, uh he, yeah, of all things, played keyboards for Cindy Lauper. <laughs> <laughs> he was on that infamous major album that she put out, and he did all the keyboards for Girls Just Want to Have Fun. And he wrote those, but he only got paid session work. <laughs> but uh, he actually... Uh, he was all into that whole industrial style of music. And eventually I got to meet a few people that worked with Trent Reznor. And they said that he is a very interesting person. Now, mind you, I only got to meet Wayne Static and hang out with him when he was an intern. But uh, it it comes from this. I I basically felt the same way as what everybody used to say about uh, Trent. And uh, one of the engineers I worked with worked with Trent and they said he is very talented. And I think with Mm -hmm. the soundtrack, the soundtrack picks of the actual mute, like regular music that they have there was amazing itself. So I think, you know, if you want to go out there and get it, go get it. I'm sure you could download that music easily nowadays. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it's on Apple Music. So (laughs) check it out. But uh, I did have a good decade or so long crush on Trent Reznor since I got into Nine Inch Nails in my senior year, about the same time I got into The Crow. Um, I loved uh, Pretty Hate Machine, their first album. I think I played the hell out of that, probably broke the cassette tape, (laughs) had to go buy another. And uh, yeah, all all throughout his musical career, I I just thought he was a genius, but yeah, yeah, was a bit uh, enamored with him for some time as well. (laughs) <laughs> yeah it's, it's yeah i still enjoy it i still play it so i recommend out anybody who has not actually watched the movie and you're just listening to the podcast why are you listening to this podcast anyway <laughs> go watch the movie actually go buy the book go get the trade you could probably download it at this point and get it from amazon and read the book or read the trade and then yeah, you know, go watch the movie. It's out there. It's on iTunes as well, and you can watch it. Yeah, on and Rebel if you're not TV. up for you know horror, this is a good Halloween night movie as well. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so that was our crow review this evening or day or whenever you're listening to this. So thanks everybody for listening. I'm Mark. I'm Laura. And this was Panels to Pixels. Good night, everybody. Good night. Who are you? I'm the one who sprung your chief of police up. No, you're not. Yes, I am. You're 90 fucking years old. How the fuck did you hang him? I am 105, and you curse too much. You didn't kill him. I did, all by myself. How? Psychic powers. I can manipulate material with my mind. Is that right? Maybe, uh, I'm Dr. Manhattan. He lives on fucking Mars, and he can't do that. Look like us. Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm Mark. And I'm Steve. And, well, you just heard the Crow 25th anniversary podcast review. So it was with me and Lyra, and I have to thank Lyra for doing that. Now we're on to Watchmen Season 1 Episode 2, which is entitled Martial Feats of Comanche horsemanship it's a mouthful man i'm telling you oh yeah that's like i tried to say that three times and it was just like marshall feeds um, misery that's, you know. it's totally yeah right, 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 right. i'm just like what <laughs> so yeah um but yeah uh marshall feats of comanche horsemanship uh there you go i got it uh once it's good um <laughs> <laughs> For those that are not aware, why are you tuning in? Well, you just listened to The Crow, so that's cool. I'm glad to, Laura and Mark got to do the review of The Crow. They both love that movie and that whole uh, series and genre. I have not been as uh, quite uh, affiliated with it as though they were, so I'm really super glad they got to do that. But this is a spoiler-full podcast for Watchmen Season 1, Episode 
two. So if you have not listened, not listened, yeah, nah, leave it in. I don't care. Uh, <laughs> if you have not watched episode two yet of Watchmen, why are you listening to us? I'm going to ask this every week. But hey, everybody does. <laughs> go back, go back and watch the episode. Watch the episode again. You know, because gosh, there's going to be things that we miss. There's going to be things that 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 you miss that hopefully we can point out to you. But this is a spoiler full podcast, so we are going to talk about all the cool things that happened in this episode. Cool. And before we get into our top five, we're going to go about things that we liked about the actual episode overall. Yeah, I I really loved the pacing, that the pacing has changed a little bit from the first episode to this second episode. Things kind of slowed down a little bit. We got a lot more dialogue. We got a lot more character interaction. Uh, we got this flashback of Angela. But it's it, there was a really cool, there was a lot of really cool directional director's things that were done in this episode that made it very not just cinematic but but theatrical um that i really really liked yeah definitely the way it was filmed the way the drama is within each character and how they talk to one another and basically getting down to the point of each character and how they are affiliated with one another it actually brings the story together and it's not just angela centric if you think about it it's not pointed or around her for the most part they talk you see other characters especially characters that are sitting there eating dinner on their couch with their mask on just above their nose <laughs> yeah that was very that was very much a callback to rorschach in the watchman movie and in on the comic when we see him several times in the comic we see him eating with that kind of his mask pulled up and then just all you can see is his mouth yeah. going the part that i have would be this was more Angela focused in some respect where we get to know and who find out who this person is. We're seeing it through mostly her eyes at some points from what I could see. It's her investigation of what's going on. And I really like that aspect, especially that it's a female driven one and not only just a female driven one, an actual black actress or character. And it's centered around that whole Oklahoma riot or those all oh, that thing the the massacre that, the tulsa massacre, massacre that happened yeah yeah it's really really cool that we're, we we have that in this day and age and, and with all the themes that this show is is developing that they have that the lead character is this you know female black woman and that's amazing female black woman it, uh, all women are female Anyway, <laughs> um, uh, that we have this lead female black character is is just amazing. And you would think that the show, you know, with having someone like Don Johnson in the cast, you would think that Don Johnson is going to be or Tim Blake Nelson is going to be the big the big names. But that's not the case. Regina King is the big name. Louis Gossett Jr. is huge for, for me. I just yeah. love him from way back in Iron Eagle to everything he's done just about. Silverado, you know, yeah, not Silverado. That was Danny Glover. That I keep stuff. getting Danny Glover and Louis Gossett Jr. mixed up. That's not right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> They're around the same. It's age true. It's true. It. <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, so there's just that this fact that not only are we seeing things from her perspective, but we're also seeing other people's perspective of her. Just like when they zip up the body bag with with Judd's body in it, the camera angle is up, and she is in the center. Of that picture, you got her on, on in the center, and then Red Scare on one side, and Lock, Looking Glass on the other. But she is definitely the central figure that we can see through the through kind of through the eyes of that dead body. So that was really cool. Yeah. So I think we should get on to our top five. Absolutely. Why don't you start? Sure. Uh, my number five would be the people protesting scene was really intense. That that scene just showed people taking action into their own hands. Regina King's character, Angela, taking action on the protesters. That was really intense. Thus forcing her to seek her roots and the history of what happened there. Uh, when she goes and they, uh, I guess the computer asks her for tissue to see if the, her relation and stuff. 
Yeah, you can hear you, as she's walking up the steps there, and you see the protesters with their signs. And I was I was a little surprised that we didn't have kind of an altercation there, but it seemed very peaceful, even though there were some very harsh words being said uh, to her, even as she's walking through that crowd. So yeah, getting up, getting into that building where that museum is, and where obviously they're telling the story of the 1921 yeah. Tulsa massacre. My number five was just the the White Knight flashback that uh, that we get to see, and th- they mentioned this on, on TV podcast industry, so I want to give them a shout out for for noticing this, and then I noticed it on my second and third watches that it's when she's clinging to the body of Judd, and the camera shifts to that scene where she's clinging to her husband, and it's on the white the attack of the White Knight. So I thought that was a really cool direction, but one of the things that stood out to me in this scene, we get this flashback is that Judd tells her that he got his, that she got hers with the stabbing in the head, which we saw, and that he bled out. But there was a second guy in her in her flashback, there was a second guy with that double barrel shotgun aimed at her head that she passes out, and the next thing you know, she wakes up and she's in the hospital room. So I'm assuming we're going to get another flashback to tell us what happened to yeah. that guy or who that guy is, because there's no answer to that, because he came out of nowhere. And, you know, it sounded like from what Don, from what uh, Judd says, it sounded like it was kind of one guy attacking each, because he said, you got your guy, I got my guy, and like that, in that kind of way. So I'm wondering if there's some, you know, um, either unreliable narration there in that her flashback may be unreliable with the second person or, you know, who that second person is that, and, and who, you know, who yeah, took that person definitely. out. Yeah, there's a missing element that we're not seeing. Maybe there's more to that flashback. Maybe it's another character that we'll encounter later on that fills that void to explain that whole story, because obviously we want to see it, that how that story began and ended and to see where she was. So I'm hoping we will get that eventually. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you're number four. Uh, That would be the scene with Louis, Louis Gossett Jr.'s uh, character with Angela. I thought that was really interesting. And just like you, I love to see Louis Gossett Jr. But he was sitting there in the wheelchair where Don Johnson's, you know, body was Mm -hmm. hung. Yeah, I, I when he's sitting there, you're talking about when he's sitting under the body yeah. of Don Johnson. Okay. Yeah, basically, uh, he he knows something, and it's funny that he has to take pills to gather his memories. I guess, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's like it, it just brings on questions to me of like he has all these issues, but was he once part of the Minutemen or part of that crew at one point? Yeah, I, I have this later in either in my notes or in my top five with, with Will because I have a theory on Will that I'll go on record on our podcast. I've already gone on record on another podcast about this. I think Will is hooded justice. I think what we're going to find out is that the history has been skewed as to who hooded justice is and that it actually is Will. It is a black a man, man, not a white man as depicted in the American hero story and as we saw – in the trade comic book there's now there's some things that were pointed out on another podcast that that may not indicate that he could be hooded justice but i still i'm gonna stick to my guns and if i'm wrong at the end i'll admit that i'm wrong or if it was a misdirection that they they got me uh that damon lindelof uh got me but i really really think that uh that that Lewis Gossett Jr. that will is hooded justice. That's my. That's going to be my. Uh, I'm going to stand I on that you. until it's I, proved I, otherwise. I feel you when it comes to that. I I believe you. You have a better keen sight into this than I do. <laughs> <laughs> I I just and and maybe the the problem maybe the problem is is that it's too on the nose that he's hooded justice. But I but there's enough people that don't think he is, and there's enough evidence that he's not. That I just I, I I'm gonna stick to it. I, I really am. <laughs> um, so that brings us to, to yeah. my number four, uh, and it's just that whole roundup there at Nixonville, and that was just just brutal. It was scary in regards to what the police did and how the police reacted. Even though they were just tasering people, it was still it reminded me a lot of 
the the pictures we see and the things we've heard of like the riots against the Vietnam war in the sixties and the early seventies, when police would, well, when they fired on, you know, police fired with rubber bullets onto a group of protesters, it was very similar and it really was scary. And then of course we have sister Knight standing out saying, no, she's not going to participate. And then when that guy kind of makes a move on her, uh, her or actually makes a move on looking glass, I guess she just goes off on that guy. And it was way over the top yeah. what she did. But then when she gets in the car, it really looks like she even scared herself. Yeah, you can see it on her face with that. Yeah. Yeah. And then she sees the cup and she's like, okay, I got to go figure out what's going on uh, here. Uh, and, did you ever notice though, with, uh, with her mask, it's painted on. Yeah, she did that when when we see her getting dressed there in uh, in the bakery when she has Will when she's brought Will in and she's got him handcuffed. She sprays kind of a makeup thing and it's very um, I don't know if it meant to be a callback to it, but in the the Blade Runner the movie, yeah. the first Blade Runner movie, that's what Daryl Hannah she kind of sprays some kind of a makeup thing across her eyes, a very similar mm-hmm. black strip. Yeah, across her eyes. So it's it's kind of cool that we have this sister knight who's doing this thing where she's spraying this black across her face, and then she's lifting a black over mask, mouth, yeah. which is similar, yeah, over the bottom part of her her face, like what the other police wear, hood. and then she's got the hood as as well. So so yeah, that's her costume. You know, is is this black face paint, and then pulling the mask up over her face as opposed to pulling it down or, uh, or yeah, I guess and it's yeah. very simplistic. It's nothing e- extravagant. Like, uh, who's the character with the mirrored face? I forget his name. Looking, yeah, looking, looking glass. glass has that looking glass, silver yeah. wannabe Rorschach mask. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very Rorschach like in that it, it, it reflects what other people are seeing. <laughs> you know, the joke in the first episode when uh, Judd is tying his tie and he tells him, pull your mask down, and he uses the mirror face so he can straighten <laughs> his tie out, <laughs> you know. Also, too, the, uh, the callback to the different costumes. I think Panda has a regular costume, and we see him <laughs> when they're actually having, like, a meeting, and he's got a panda mask on him. He's got It's like a panda <laughs> mascot head that he's cut – the bottom part out and then red scare. It's like a red ski mask that he's got. Oh, like it's the most simplistic thing you could ever yeah. do. Like, you, you know, he's got, <laughs> it's just some of their costumes are, are very, are, are comical in a way, but at the same time, they're reminiscent of what, you know, what real yeah. life people yeah. <laughs> would do. You know, it, it's always funny to me when we see these, especially this happens in the Marvel. Well, in, it's a Spider. I know you're a huge Spider-Man fan, but it's one thing that bugs me about uh, the Spider-Man. And they kind of, they, they kind of uh, solved it in the current I'm- Spider-Man thing that you're, when you see him with his, and he's got his like homemade costume and then Tony Stark brings him in a real costume. But that's what, like, that's what I would do is I have like a red t-shirt with a blue vest over it and blue pants and a ski mask that I cut yeah. the eyes out of. That would be yeah. my, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. So I think we're yeah. to your number my three. My number three would be the the time jumps, but it's very interesting within the story. We see the fifties with, I think is Red Crimson, but... No, see, I, I don't think that was a time jump. I think we're seeing the American hero story depicted. Okay. That's what, that was on the TV. Like, that's why they had that whole disclaimer yeah. at the beginning of it, where it said, you know, acts of violence. Blah, blah, blah. And so I think that was Hooded Justice okay. attacking those guys in yeah, the Yeah, and it was all r- the robbery within the grocery store. He protects the people, but with major violence. You could see the bloodshed. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there was that disclaimer for people not to watch it, but... Uh, he tells his story about his thirst for justice, and it, it shows it to no end of how he was ready to wreak justice on those. Yeah. So that that was to me that was pretty interesting to see because it, it's a bit of history within the actual episode. Yeah, and I think we're gonna see more of that as as we go on through the through the se- the seasons. That's gonna be kind of cool. Yeah. And your number three. So my number three. Yeah, it's, it's just the whole idea. I think we talked a little bit about the reparations, the red predations uh, that were – they were payments to the families of the Tulsa race massacre. I think we kind of went back and forth last week. I was – I really thought it was about the white knight 
uh, killings, but no, we, we do find out today for sure. It's all about the, uh, the 1921 race massacre. And so people can go into this, this museum, they can have their DNA tested to see if they are a, if they are a living victim of the violence that occurred on that day, or if they are a descendant or have ancestors who were victims of that violence. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And and of course, you know, she, it's so funny. It asked her name and she just says, will, and uh, then it, it doesn't really get any further ID of her. You know, but later we get that reveal that will is her grandfather. Because, you know, the, the, the voice comes back on the phone and says, yes, your DNA is confirmed as being, you are a victim. We know that he was the child of the couple that were apparently killed in, uh, in the, the massacre. And so he is due reparations for that. And then, they, then the voice says, you have two ancestors and two descendants do you want to know if you want to know who those descendants are, but you have, but she had to tell them a name. Yeah. And so she gives them her name. And of course the voice comes back. She says, uh, you know, Angela Abar. And he, the voice comes back and says, will you, Angela Abar is your granddaughter. And so suddenly we, we, we get the connection between her, but now I wonder about who this other Who's, who's Will's other ancestor? Because it said there yeah. were two, and she only gave them one name. Oh, and by the way, I ran this back and watched it three times. There definitely is something going on with Will because he reaches into the pot of boiling water and pulls an egg out. Yes. With his bare hand. Yes, I noticed that too. <laughs> okay. Okay, so the first time I saw it, I was like, huh? And then like the second time, I was like, no, no I got to run that back. And I run it back and I go, yeah, he, cause I, then, then he crush He like, he like crushes the egg with his hand and, and like scatters the shell and then eats the egg. And like, did he just pull that out of the pan with his bare hand? Yep. He just pulled that out of the pan with a bear, with his bare hand. And then he broke it with his bare hand again. Like he yep. kind of rolls it on the counter a little bit, but he definitely like used his own hand to just <laughs> Like his uh, nerve endings were dead or something. I don't know. Either that or he's got some kind of a pain or threshold or his hands are – I don't know. Uh, you know, he's there's obviously something more going on with him than uh, meets, than the, meets eye. the eye. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right. Well, my number two would be the reenactment of Dr. Manhattan's creation with Ozymandias <laughs> on <Ew>. Ozymandias' <laughs> servants. That was disturbing. Especially how, uh, if you look at it, they all look like a bunch of clones. To say the least, yeah, they're all exactly the same. <laughs> Apparently, he made clones of his servants, and they all want to cater to his delusional whims. And uh, they are eager to fill the roles of somebody who winds up getting blasted or cooked yeah. in that, that little box to, to it, show how <laughs> Dr. Manhattan came to be. It's the goofiest thing, isn't it? Because the, the the guy says, you know, he says, uh, would you like to be, what's your name? And he says Montrose. And he's like, would you like to be the next Mr. Phillips? And he goes, I'd be honored to be the next Mr. Phillips. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Really, dude? <laughs> yeah, I'm just, uh, this this whole, I am waiting. And I'm sure we're probably going to have to wait till the last episode to get the full reveal of what is going on here you know maybe we'll get it a little bit earlier but uh, uh they're definitely we we have definitely uh ventured into a twilight zone <laughs> yeah exactly it's weird. i don't know who <laughs> this guy is. well and that's the thing like uh from what other podcasts have said and if you go to imdb i don't want to spoil this for you, but, but this has already been spoiled for if you've done any kind of research on this show that jeremy irons is playing adrian Vite. Ozymandias from the comic book and but yet we have not had him we have not had him be called Adrian Vite he's been called the master um if you look at the descriptions of some of the episodes they call they call him the lord of the manor um so I'm just waiting for the reveal of what what this is really all about um so that brings us to my number two yes uh, just just the fact that I noticed that this was the same director for these first two episodes, and uh, I want to go back to what I said earlier, 
that how different the pacing was of these really amazed me because at first when the first time I watched this episode and I, and I was like, man, this is really a departure, a different, different from the first episode. I thought, man, it must be a different director. And when I looked it up, I was like, no, no, it's the same director. So I was really surprised to see it's a female director at that, uh, that any director was, it would be able to change gears so quickly between these two episodes that just because that first episode there's just so much going on and then in this episode there's just a lot of character development oh definitely and that's what we need that's what you want from a show is like once you start it you want to know the background who these characters are where they came from because at this point with angela and will and like even uh, Don Johnson's character. Mm-hmm. I'm sure we're going to get something more out of that. Yeah. And yeah, sure. uh, these these characters, you, we don't know them from a hole in a wall. All we know is the comics at this point. And right. obviously in reference to like Dr. Manhattan. And eventually they're probably going to top on those events of what happened within the comic book. So I, I uh, would hope we're going to get something besides – um, the master's depiction of it, that we're going to get some other mention of Dr. Manhattan. That somebody is at least going to acknowledge that he exists, you know? Yeah. Okay. So that brings us to my number one, uh, my number two, or no. You, uh, no, I did my number two. You did number your two. Uh, uh, yeah. My number one, your number one, your number okay. one. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, basically we already talked about it. That would be that ending, which would be is Lewis Gossett Jr.'s character. Will, Angela's grandfather, perhaps, or is he in some sort of relation with her? And that's what I started thinking towards the end. Well, I mean, as long as that, as long as that DNA, that DNA was correct, which it seems a little weird that you'd be able to get enough DNA off a cup like that for a decisive test. But I guess you can. I mean, I know there's a lot of the, today's technology has gone crazy, um, but we don't see as it's it's a there's a weird technological thing going on in this world and i know i've done a i've looked a little bit at the the pdpedia on hbo.com that there's some that there was a lot of things about after the squid attack in the 80s that they thought technology had a a a hand in that so they kind of slowed down the advance of the technology uh, or at least certain technologies maybe because obviously the the dna resequencing the dna cataloging has has happened i mean i was in the military my dna has been cataloged but i didn't think there's that many people other than like i said government uh or military that had their dna actually cataloged by the u.s government you know yeah. uh so i i just found that, that that's another interesting thing that they were able to read a lot of that out of it so that brings us to my number one yes uh and just that that kkk outfit that Angela finds in in Judd's closet, you know, and then she brings it back to the bakery with her, and she kind of throws it at Will, and she asks if Will placed it there. And we get that that uh, amusing line from him where he goes, well, "What floor was it on?" Because you know I have a problem with stairs. <laughs> and she's like, "Well, <laughs> you know, well you, but you did kill and hang up the chief." And he's like, "Oh yeah, I did do that too." So you know, so uh, I'm really curious. It's just like you just said earlier. For every answer, we get four more questions. You know, for every answer we get, we get, like you said, we got, we have the answer. We know Will is her grandfather. How is that possible? You know, he says something like, your parents never said, never told you anything about me, did they? And she just kind of is like, no, I didn't know who you are. And so it is interesting, like I said, for every answer, we get three or four more questions. Yeah. That is true. So, um, so you had a quote here that you really liked? Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, w- what Angela says to Will when he was looking for his pills, and he goes, can't you just float those pills over to yourself? Yeah, that was great when he's like, well, maybe I'm telekinetic. You know, yeah. she's, she's like asking him all these questions. About, well, how did you get him up there? What did you do? How did you – this and that. And he's like – and so it's just <laughs> – she – you can – by the end of this episode, when we find out that they're related, you can definitely tell that they're related, you know, yeah, <laughs> because yeah. they just have these quick back and forth. I love – they have a really great 
interaction between the two of them. I don't know if they've done anything uh, before together or not, or if it just they just had such a good chemistry acting wise, not romantic wise, but but acting chemistry wise uh, was really really good between the two of them. Yeah. And uh, the only thing I have for notes would be, and I think you probably answered it with him, but you could tell everybody, but I thought Angela's daughter is lighter skinned than she is. I was wondering who was her father? Was it Jed? And with Angela's reactions, it makes me think so, but I wondered if we would see, you know, that come into play for future episodes, but you could answer that. because Yeah, those are her partner's kids, her partner who was killed in the White Knight. Those are not her and her husband's children because when she comes to in the hospital she asks about doyle who i'm assuming was her partner and judd says he and uh he says the wife's name he says they were found they were in bed that's where we found them and then he says christopher took the the his sister and the baby and hid in the closet Uh, so that's the three the three kids because right. then she says Topher. He likes to be called Topher, not Christopher. And so that's where later on we get when she comes into his room and she tells him that Judd is dead. He And he says, don't tell uh, Angela or not Angela, um, the other two kids. He says their names. Don't tell them. I will tell them tomorrow. Yeah. You know, for some reason, he doesn't want to tell them on that day. So, yeah, that's that's it was a good pull. It was one thing on, in the I think it was in the first episode that I noticed there's a difference, like something not, or it might've been the beginning. I I know there was a point where I had that same question. I was like going, those kids are really light skinned to be, yeah. be, to be the progeny of two, you know, black people. parents. Yeah, yeah. To be. Yeah. So, um, well, I had a couple of notes here. I thought was kind of interesting is, uh, one of the actors, when they're doing that, when they're showing that reenactment of the grocery store robbery, one of the actors, uh, looks a lot like Rorschach. It's got the red, he's got the red hair and the freckles. I'm sure it wasn't meant to be. I'm sure it's just an Easter egg to the comic, mm-hmm. but it, it definitely, that, uh, that actor really did. Like when I saw it the third time I watched this episode, I was like, that kid looks like, looks like the, the way they portray it. looks like Rorschach, you know? Yeah. So I'm like that kid. Uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting. And then I noticed when they're, when they're uh, attacking or they're, when uh, he's talking to Nixonville through the bullhorn that red scare actually has a badge. He wears a badge around his neck on like, like a dog tag chain around his neck. So he actually has like an actual badge that yeah, he like wears. A badge chain and it's hanging yeah, around his neck. It's actually like a policeman's badge or a detective's badge or something. And that when, when Angela was driving to the crime scene, the reporters are banging on her window, the, the window of the Monte Carlo and they're calling her detective. So I the the impression I got is that these these mass vigilantes are not they're not just mass vigilantes they're actually members and I think we might have talked a little bit about this in the last episode that these that they are actually members of most of them are actually members of the police force like we said Panda is an actual looks like he's an actual police officer you know we see that Red Scare has this badge even though Angela has said she's retired Apparently, as Sister Knight, we haven't seen her carry a badge yet, but they, there's definitely the implication there the reporters think she's a detective. So yeah. I thought that was interesting. And then I, I absolutely love – anytime we get to see a cameo from Jim Beaver, I absolutely love that. He is the man that's on the porch. I don't know if he's meant to be uh, the kid's grandfather or their uncle or what, but he's on the porch, and he talks to Angela for a few minutes. And you know, Angela says, can we take a rain check? And he's like, I'll take a real check. You know, like it's my time for visitation with the kids. So obviously he is either a grandparent or an uncle or he has some sort of relation to Doyle, to the the children's biological family, uh, you know. And so she gave him a check to get him. So I hope that's not just a one off. I hope we get to see more of Jim Beaver because I just I love him as an actor. He was he was he did a quick cameo on the boy, the the last oh last episode of the second to the last episode of the boys mm-hmm. he's been a regular on the tv show supernatural which i love uh for years and uh just just love seeing jim beaver yeah definitely so as a whole for the series so far what are you thinking uh, it's you know it's, it's excruciating having to wait week to week 
um, <laughs> to, for this. Uh, for this, I already kind of talked about that. I think Will is the original, the real hooded justice that the the portray. So I'm really excited to see. And, and like I said before, every time we get an answer, we get three more questions with that answer. It's just I'm I'm excited to see where this this uh, season is going to go. What are we going to do with this? I'm really I, I'm torn because I know that uh, Damon Lindelof, the creator, he was uh, really involved in uh, a show called The Leftovers, which was on HBO, which was really good, which did like three seasons and then was done. He was part of the the group that did Lost, but I think he's learned some things yeah. since then. And uh, so I'm, I'm excited to see where they go. I hope that they have a – either this is going to be a one-off miniseries – or if they're going to do multiple seasons that they already know exactly how many seasons they're going to do and how they're going to end it and what they're going to, they're going to do with it. Cause that's, I really think that's the, the worst thing about some TV shows is they just go on too long. Oh yeah. There or, are... or they get cut short. Oh yeah, definitely. It's like, it, there's no in between. It's mm-hmm. either too long or too short. There are certain shows that, you know, that, well, luckily we had it with Jessica Jones where at least, we got a complete three seasons. Right. And, you know, I, at first when they started with Daredevil, they wanted to do three, but they wound up eventually just putting it at four. Mm-hmm. But they left us hanging. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, so yeah. And, and like one of my favorite TV shows of all time is ending. This is their, they're in, it's in their final season, it, but it's the 15th season. But they had a way of every five or six seasons, they didn't revamp the whole show, but they kind of did. They kind of would do a thing where they would change things up, where the showrunner would change, and it would become fresh again. Uh, so that that I think that was a great model of a show that could run a long time and stay fresh, in, in my opinion. Yeah. So for me, I'm just loving the show as it is. It's completely crazy and bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> It's history filled along with, you know, the genre of the comic books, but we have the subtext of political and historical events, obviously one particular historical events event, mm-hmm. but I'm assuming that they're going to wind up throwing in more. If this does go on to multiple seasons, I'm hoping that we get to see something like that, not in just one state and city area. I'm hoping like maybe New York or Chicago or even in California or Texas, Something it would almost like be that. interesting, you know, if, if they do do multiple seasons, it would be interesting to see if they pick a different sociopolitical topic. Like like this this season, so far anyway, is definitely racism. That's the yeah. the big sociopolitical uh, kind of, of problem that they're that they're looking at is this idea. But it, and I one of the things I love about uh, about the show as well is there is a balance to it. It's not purely poking it's not purely making the the conservative point of view look bad uh or making the liberal point of view look bad it's kind of saying hey both extremes are not good N- you know neither extreme is good exactly you know yeah. the, the the extreme the fact that you know I, I just, it drives me crazy i can't believe that they were able to get some law passed that allows them to lock police officers guns down until they get permission to use them that yes. is just like that's in that very first episode it's like hey can it's like panic yeah. can you release my gun and it took him how long but that ended him because by yeah. the time he got to that gun he was gone i mean i can see where our world is 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 could go to that way but then that's a scary thing for if you're a cop um but then the other side of it you know when you see the other side of going way too far the other direction you know, to where we have these these cops just showing up at this this basically this it looks like a trailer park homeless camp, and they just basically go in and just arrest everybody. They're just yeah. we don't care if you're a member of the cavalry or not. We're taking you all in, and we're going to question everybody. Uh, that's just it's it's so there's these extremes that they're they're showing us that the extremes are it's not good to have no. either extreme. And yeah. so I, I like that. I like that it's 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 very balanced in, in my yeah. Opinion. It is definitely balanced, and I like that idea. Unlike in the 
state of events of the world or this yeah. nation now <laughs> but yeah. at least you know to to me at least they have that good keen insight as they're writing this they're they're balancing it between and showing both sides and you don't really get that it's like I always state this in any if there's like a problem within a relationship or whatnot, there's always a he said, she said, mm -hmm. or he and he said, or her and her said. Right. But there's there's two truths his, hers, or his, his, or hers, hers, and then there's always that real truth in between. And I'm glad that they approach this with how they're writing the show so far. Because it shows you a balance between both. And yeah. obviously there is some sort of missing element that the whole story is going to unravel in the end. And I just like how that that kind of storytelling is coming through. Yeah, very cool. All right, you got some comic talk? Oh, yeah, definitely. Obviously, uh, Joker the movie came out and it's getting a lot of uh, nods to Oscar nominations and things of that nature being heralded as one of the top grossing rated r films that are out there and especially a comic book genre one but we also it came out about a week and a half ago two weeks ago actually probably when i was stuck in atlanta <laughs> for the con mm. but uh john carpenter's the joker comic came out and it's a one-off and that came out recently i was not able to get a copy i was hoping to i went to the comic book shop with uh my co-worker and we both asked, and they had one copy, and unfortunately, they didn't. I said, you take it, Eric. <laughs> so he wound up getting it. But I was, oddly enough, it was one of those where it was for promotional use only. So they handed it to him for free. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> so I'm looking to get the uh, one of those that I could find online. I think there's a hardcover-based one, which I would love to get in case of in the, in the event that I actually get to meet John Carpenter and someday and have him sign it. Ooh, but that there you go. Out, yeah, There's it, a get for a con. John Carpenter. Man. Actually, he was at Monster Mania New Jersey last year. Ooh, and our nice. friend Jamie wanted to go see him, but I couldn't make it that weekend. And she goes, oh, if you go, you got to go. And I heard the line wasn't really that huge. So it, he seems yeah. to be doing these things more and more. So nice. I'm hoping eventually. But uh, yeah. it's highly regarded by many a reader. So I recommend... Uh, those of you out there like me, I'm going to have to go search online on Amazon and uh, order one. So uh, cool. it should still be available for order. They have limited edition ones that are outrageously priced because you can get it signed by John Carpenter, but they're like $100 and things of that nature. But Right. But, and they're limited edition. And like I stated, you know, the Joker movie, awesome. I have not yet seen it, but everything I'm Oh, hearing, it's good. It's heralded as one of the best. I plan on seeing it. I I just have not gotten to it with, you know, obviously, like I said, I went to the con. And yeah. after I got back, you get that whole, you know, you need a vacation from your vacation. So I was <laughs> back into work mode and they kind of inundate you with work because you took time off. Exactly. But, yeah, eventually I'll get to it. And I r highly recommend it to it because a lot of my friends have been telling me, like, dude, you need to see this. So it's I'm good. telling you, everybody out there, guys, go see it. I liked it. So. Yeah. So that's pretty much all that I have for uh, this week for Comic Talk. But uh, maybe you could tell people how to get in touch with us. We can be heard on Spotify, Google Play, Apple iTunes, or whatever podcast player of choice you use. If there's a chance to give us a rating, give us a good rating on there. If you can write it out and they send us a notification that we got a review, we will read it on the podcast. You can check out our website at www.panelstopixelspodcast.com. Right now, that will redirect you to our Facebook page, but eventually we will have extra content up there for you to see and hear. Also, you can submit your theories through our Facebook group. We do a Facebook post each week for the episode. It'll have the episode title. It'll have the date that we'll be recording, and it'll have the deadline for your feedback on that post so just reply to that post and give us your comments on the episode that is at our facebook page which is facebook.com slash panels to pixels you can also email us at panels to pixels one at gmail.com that's panels to pixels one the to is spelled out right there in the middle and the number one at gmail.com or you could call and leave us a voicemail at 845-350-2095 
Again, that phone number is 845-350-2095. Where else, where else can we be heard, Mark? Or where well, else can people hear you? Yeah, well, you could hear me. I'm a, a co-host on The Walking Dead Talk Through with Brian Malosh on Talk Through Media. We review The Walking Dead each week. This will stay this actual podcast will stay on the Next Level Podcast Network, but there's always a link. We always share everything on our Facebook page to uh that we what we do on Talk Through Media as well as uh Walking Dead Talk Through on our Panels to Pixels podcast Facebook page. Uh, you could hear us at, at pretty much for Walking Dead Talk Through uh, an Apple Podcasts or whatever wherever you get your podcasts. We, you know, I believe you could hear us on Stitcher, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, and I think Spotify as well. Yeah, we're still on Spotify. So keep in touch here or go to talkthroughmedia.com website and leave some feedback directly on the actual Talk Through Media website. We have a phone number there as well. And you can hear me right here, of course, every week recovering whichever TV show that uh, that week we're reviewing or a movie. I uh, also send in feedback to various other podcasts. I send in feedback to Mark's podcast on Walking Dead Talk Through. I send in po- uh, audio feedback to Walking Dead Cast, and usually try to get something to TV Podcast Industries for their Watchmen review, as you've heard me mention earlier. So that's our show this evening tonight, and this was a double one. I don't know if we're able to do that again, but uh, we we gave you double the fun. Uh, got you the crow in the very beginning, and the Watchmen season one episode two in the last half. So all I could say is thanks everybody for listening. I'm Mark, and I'm Steve, and this was Panels Pixels. Thank you everybody, and good night. Good night. <laughs>